obviously one of the things that anyone who's familiar with you um thinks about is this role of dopamine and understanding addiction. This clearly plays into a big part of your clinical practice as a psychiatrist. Um, but I also realize that terms get thrown around quite loosely, and sometimes it can just be helpful for people to understand uh, a little bit of, of what we describe as, as the semantics. So I, I'd like to actually start with an understanding maybe of some of the biochemistry and the neurobiology of dopamine. And then I want to actually talk about what an addiction really is. Um, but this word dopamine is, is something everyone has heard of. Um, but tell us a little bit about the molecule, how it works, um, and maybe even some of what the supporting cast of other neurotransmitters look like that factor into these pathways that, that obviously play an important role in our evolution and our, our existence. Yeah, great place to start. Thank you for setting the stage. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter. So it's a chemical that we make in our brains. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals that allow for fine-tuned modulation of the neural circuits that make us who we are. You might think of the brain as a collection of wires. Uh, those wires are neurons. They send electrical impulses one to the other, but the neurons don't actually touch end to end, there's a little gap between them called the synapse. And that gap is bridged by molecules called neurotransmitters. There are many different neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, they have many different functions, but dopamine has become uh, kind of the common currency for measuring pleasure, reward, and motivation. It's not the only neurotransmitter in involved in that process, obviously, uh, but it is the final common pathway for all reinforcing substances and behaviors. So whether the substance is primarily, um, you know, modulating our serotonergic system or norepinephrine or the nicotinic system or the endogenous opioid system or the endogenous cannabinoid system, the final common pathway for all of those chemical cascades is to release dopamine in a dedicated part of the brain called the reward circuitry, which consists of the prefrontal cortex, that's that large gray matter area right behind our foreheads, and then these deeper limbic or emotion brain structures like the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. We're always releasing dopamine at a baseline tonic level, uh, but when we do something that's pleasurable or reinforcing or that our brains consider salient or important for survival, so in, in some cases, it might even be an aversive stimulus. Um, then temporarily, we will increase dopamine firing above baseline. That generally feels good to us, which is how we tell our brains, oh, this is important. I should approach, explore, and consider doing this again. So broadly speaking, that that's dopamine's function. It's not its only function, by the way. So dopamine is also really important for movement. As you know, Parkinson's disease, which is a movement disorder, is characterized by a decrease or a depletion of dopamine in a different part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Um, and one of the ways that we treat Parkinson's is to actually give people L-DOPA, which is a dopamine precursor. Why do we give them L-DOPA and not dopamine? Because dopamine itself actually can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we give them a precursor that crosses the blood-brain barrier and then um, you know, binds to dopamine receptors in the substantia nigra, allowing for more fluid movements in people with Parkinson's. Unfortunately, uh, L-DOPA uh, transformed to dopamine also binds dopamine receptors in the reward pathway, which is why about a quarter of folks with Parkinson's who get treated with L-DOPA end up with uh, addictive disorders that are usually uh, reversible when you stop the L-DOPA and tend to be um, dose dependent. So the more L-DOPA, the more likely the sex addiction, shopping addiction, or whatever the compulsive behavior. Okay, a lot there um, and many questions, but one of them is the role of the prefrontal cortex. Now, again, I think people listening to us probably um, have heard about the prefrontal cortex. Uh, it comes up a lot when we talk about dementia it talks it comes up a lot when we talk about higher order cognitive function uh, judgment centers um, but it is also something that i believe and i could be wrong on this but i believe this is a part of the brain that is more developed in our species than in others um, so i guess a, a question then would be around the um, 
addictive potential of our species versus others? Are we more susceptible to what we're about to talk about as addiction um, with a larger prefrontal cortex, or is it not as simple as just the anatomic size of this part of the brain? So, um, so I guess to back up for a second, the, the prefrontal cortex has many roles, but when we think about its role in um, addiction or other appetitive disorders, it actually has a stop function. So if you think about, mm. um, you know, if you if you analogize to a car, the prefrontal cortex um, acts like the brakes on the car. It allows for delayed gratification. This is where we have the control centers. Uh, it allows for appreciating future consequences. Uh, it's, it lights up when we're engaged in autobiographical narrative. And of course, narrative is part of the ways that we um, actually uh, create metacognitive awareness to inform future decisions. So having a, a very robust prefrontal cortex is potentially protective against mm. addiction. Um, people who have cognitive or attentional disorders who are thought to have a disorder of the prefrontal cortex, for example, attention deficit disorder, are at higher risk to develop addictive disorders. So essentially, again, if you think of this as like the car analogy, the prefrontal cortex is the brakes, the nucleus accumbens is the accelerator, the nucleus accumbens is the deep, you know, deep in the brain is rich in dopamine releasing neurons, and that like acts like the accelerator on the car. So addiction is a problem either with too little on the brakes, too much on the accelerator, or some combination thereof. In terms of whether or not um, humans are are more likely to get addicted than animals. I would say no. Um, what, what's remarkable um, about this reward circuitry is how incredibly conserved it is over millions of years of evolution and across species. So, you know, neuroscientists used to talk about. Uh, the lizard brain or the triune brain. They're, they're not typically using that, that phraseology so much anymore. But what they were getting at was that if you look at the nucleus accumbens ventral tegmental area, um, it, it's amazingly unchanged across species over millions of years of evolution. It's really, you know, our reflexive uh, approaching pleasure and avoid, avoiding pain is is what has kept us alive, you know, for for so uh, so, so many many generations on the planet, um, and so it's a very basic primordial structure that all living organisms, or, or you know, more advanced, well, not even advanced, even primitive organisms have, uh, you know, even the most primitive nematode or worm will release dopamine in response to food in its environment, which that dopamine allows it to locomote toward food. It's probably no coincidence that the same neurotransmitter involved in movement is also involved in pleasure, reward, and motivation because. Prior to about 500 years ago, if you wanted to get a reward, you had to work for it. That's no longer true, which is one of the reasons our brains are um, so confused today. So I would say, you know, to, again, to just sort of try to answer your question, um, you could almost make the opposite argument that because we have these large frontal lobes that can sort of reason and appreciate future consequences, human beings might be even more capable of getting out of the cycle of addiction than um, other organisms. I mean, it is miraculous that even people deep in the most severe addiction can find somewhere within themselves the capacity to stop using. I mean, it's, it's really, really remarkable. Um, and, and, you know, I'm it seems to me almost a miracle in my clinical work when I get people who have been in severe addictions for decades who somehow find it within themselves, either through some logical reasoning or some spiritual surrender or some combination to actually get into recovery. Mm -hmm.